All right. <clears throat> Hey, everybody. Uh, we'll give a few more minutes for everybody to get in, then we'll get started. Okay, hey, Scott, do you know if we're going to have an introduction or, or someone, for the vendor sponsors? Someone just logged in as host, uh, as co-host. Is that um, Ann? To answer your question, Randy, unsure. Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure if, if we do have a start um, for the, the, event, the sponsor announcement that we want to give an opportunity to do that then we can get started but i can look right quick randy give me just a second i'll look okay Oh, we're going to get started in just a second. Which breakout session is this one, too? Uh, yeah, I believe so. This is... You had to ask. Okay, I'm going to jump in. Our sponsor for this session is, uh, oh, that's for room one. Hold on, breakout room two. Okay, our <laughs> platinum sponsor is Rubrik. Rubrik is a fully automated API driven data management platform which provides our state and local government partners with data access and ensures data integrity no matter where their data resides. Rubrik removes traditional bottlenecks for managing data across the enterprise and converges all components necessary for building a resilient data protection, protection architecture into a single software. Rubrik utilizes the same code base across all platforms and is built on a scale out architecture, which allows for continuous management as a single system and simple unlimited scale with zero single points for a failure. No forklift upgrades and freedom for vendor lock-in. Learn more at rubric.com. Thank you, Rubric. All right. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Rubric, for the sponsorship. We definitely know it's important. So hopefully everybody was able to get to some of the sessions uh, and or some of the booths virtual booths in between, and then we'll have our session after the, or another time after this. So we wanted to switch up a little bit this go round uh, from the strike team perspective and give you some things you need to know. Uh, if you were in the business session, you did hear from Rob Main, he had the stats up on the screen uh, about how many cyber-based events there have been, and we've been involved with a lot of those. Um, so we felt that the things you need to know would be a good start but before we do that, um, actually, let's make sure that all of our uh, main lead for the strike team uh, group is able to introduce and say who they are so you know who the, the players are behind the scene. 
So we'll start with whoever wants to go, but Mark looks the No, 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 appealing. let's go to the next slide, Scott. <laughs> okay. We'll do it in alphabetical order. Like I got, look, man, I planned this out. Uh, for once. Um, for once. I, uh, I'm Scott Clark. I'm the uh, IT director for the town of Pequay Arena, and I'm one of the strike team leaders. I'm Chad Coble. I'm the CIO at Stanley County. Hey, I'm Randy Kress uh, with Rowan County, Assistant County Manager and CIO. Hi, I'm Ted Norris. I'm with Onslow County ITS, and um, I work for Glenn Hastead, which is a, a big problem. I want everybody to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Seelenbacher, Henderson County, uh, one of the IT strike team leaders. And uh, Shannon is also one of the leaders, but she is uh, doing public records right now. She's the assistant to, as she likes to say, the strike team. All right, Mark, what's next? Uh, let's, uh, next slide, uh, we, went, we briefly talked about the uh, JCTF uh, in the business meeting. Um, that was a big, uh, a, a, a big deal for us anyway. It was the formalization of the, of the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force for the state of North Carolina. Um, we are, the strike team is, is part of that. North Carolina National Guard Cyber Unit is part of that. The Fusion Center, uh, I don't know if uh, Carly Sherrod is on, doesn't look like it. Um, uh, she. She is, uh, uh, she and Tom McGrath and uh, who else is up at the Fusion Center? Randy, Scott? Uh, Mark Brighter, right, I believe. It's Brighter, is, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the uh, NC Isaac, um, North Carolina Department of Information Technology. So Rob Main, Maria Thompson, um, those folks, uh, the FBI, Secret Service, and uh, then other entities um, are as required uh, based on need. So if there is, uh, for example, uh, an incident that uh, hits a social department of social services, then Hi Ready Ready uh, up at uh, DHHS, uh, he'll be uh, part of that as well. Um, but uh, before we actually get into any of the uh, findings or anything that we want to share, uh, I wanted to throw out: Does anyone have any questions for us uh, based on your experiences or, um, or anything? Anything like that. Oh, and feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask if you if you want to. And one quick comment, and um, the, to my understanding, this format of this structure is unique to North Carolina um, throughout the nation. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yep, yeah, that's correct. Um, there's, we keep hearing that, that uh, there's a lot of interest in other states um, that don't have any, any sort of organization like this. Uh, so it is, uh, it is pretty interesting, pretty unique, and, and, and we're kind of proud of that. Um, and very effective. And very effective, yeah. 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 There are a lot of resources <clears throat> um, via the JCTF uh, at your disposal uh, when you have a cyber event. Uh, and we'll go over what triggers that, and you know, and and you know, it's basically one phone call that uh, can be made. So. Um, uh, you know what? I, I completely forgot, and I shouldn't have. But uh, Amy Walker, who is also on here, uh, she is also a member of the strike team. She's also one of the, one of the leads for the K twelve side. She uh, is a is a, a phenomenal resource for uh, uh, liaising with our K twelve partners. So sorry, I forgot to mention that. All right. So go ahead, Mark. Sir. No, go ahead. All right. So, um, so if you uh, have a cyber uh, event, uh, you are required to uh, report that to the state. Um, uh, so under, and um, under North Carolina General Statute One Forty Three B Thirteen Seventy Nine. And what is a cyber uh, uh, incident? It's an event that could jeopardize the confidentiality, integrity, availability of critical infrastructure. Um, re reporting should take place within 24 hours of confirmation of the event. Uh, that's, that's really important. Um, you know, it is key that things are reported in a timely manner. Uh, really, as soon as you uh, know that you have a problem, you should 
send up these uh, smoke signals uh, and we'll, we'll um, you'll contact the NCEM 24-hour uh, watch phone number. That one phone call um, basically will um, uh, activate the resources on the back end uh, as we're part of, uh, you know, activate the JCTF. Um, and uh, we immediately, uh, any time of the day or night, we, um, we start um, spinning up um, and we'll schedule a scoping call and then we'll, the event, you know, if you choose that you, um, you need assistance from the JCTF, um, then a scoping call will be spun up and then um, resources will start heading your way. So people, as soon as you make that call, people will already start working on your behalf to help you out. And that usually happens within hours of notification. Right. We'll have a scoping call within a couple of hours of notification. Um, and uh, it, it, the Fusion Center is, uh, uh, they're a fantastic resource to coordinate those, uh, all the resources. And Mark, uh, I'll, I'll add. No, oh, sorry, go ahead, Randy. Okay, um, you know, it is a general statute and, you know, you always look at it if it's carrot or stick, but, but keep in mind, uh, you know, it, it is all for the right reasons for the notifications. Uh, you know, if you have a event that spans multiple different agencies, you know, like we have with exchange proxy login, the state's awareness and being able to bring resources together, and you'll see that it is North Carolina emergency management that's involved. Uh, so this is being looked at now as a cyber event, just like you would have, you know, tornado, hurricanes. So it all comes down to resources. And if any of you have been through any type of cyber event, you know it's not just an immediate recovery. Uh, there's resources that come to bear, impact to services, disruption. So, you know, and there's limited resources, no matter if you're using vendors, volunteers like we are, or the state resources. So, uh, you know, while you could look at it and say, ah, just, you know, why do I have a statute that says I have to do this? Look at it as a positive. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to continue to do different things. I mean, you're going to find more policy-based issues um, with reporting and things you have to do, you know, with your DCI connection, with SBI, your uh, social services connection because of their connectivity with uh, the IRS. I mean, there's there's a lot of other things. So, you know, th this is here. We're just putting this out there to let everybody know that, um, you know, it, it is a requirement. And then also you'll start seeing on all of our slides a link to the CIS controls. Uh, and this is based off the new 8.0 of where it kind of fits in and what it helps you with. So it's just kicking those boxes and really putting you in a better security posture. Sorry, go ahead, Chad. No, actually, you you said exactly what I was fixing to say. One slight addition to that is not only is this call important um, for calling in the Calvary for help and resources, but it also starts the clock ticking for those notifications and reporting. Um, there are deadlines for certain types of events. If this if the particular event has data X fill, then there's a, a time period that you got to fall within to notify that and report that. And um, so that, that is when that clock starts ticking. So um, kind of moving on, uh, when we are not in the middle of an incident, which is uh, hopefully more frequently than not, but uh, unfortunately it's not been that way uh, over the past 12 months or so, um, we do a lot of uh, Testing, vetting, playing, I guess you could say. Uh, all of us on the, on the strike team, uh, on the cyber side anyway, um, we, we really enjoy uh, what we do. So we spend a lot of downtime. Uh, some of us more than others, like, you know, Chad, Randy, you know, anyone but me. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, um, a variety of platforms, tools, um, and whatnot to, uh, to see how we can better assist um, everyone that we that we um, every organization we respond to with during an incident um, so we did get a Shodan license um, so we can uh, uh, scan your public IP addresses for uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures open ports and services including the non-standard ports um, uh, OS fingerprint and keep in mind that Shodan is also what the bad guys use um, so whatever you can see from Shodan, that's also what they can see. So they know what kind of operating system you're, you're running uh, on an exposed IP address, um, what type of equipment it might be, uh, and so on and so forth. So what we do is uh, if you 
want to be included, you would provide uh, your public IP address space to us. You can email us at itstriketeam.nickeljesus.org. We will add that to our, our uh, Shodan instance and uh, we will notify you of uh, any, um, any anomalies that, um, that, sh that pop up and so that you can uh, potentially plug those holes. Um, a common one that we see a lot are, um, are uh, HVAC controllers and things like that. Um, but uh, we will see, uh, for example, the, in the security session, uh, one thing that was talked about uh, quite a bit this morning was RDP. Um, that is something that shows up quite frequently in our show name reports and, and one of the reasons why uh, the state put it pushed out that mandate um, to shut that down uh, because of, of the prevalence of, of exposed RDP uh, um, servers out on the internet and uh, the fact that they have been uh, no, their known exploits. Right. I mean, uh, Shodan, I'll go to uh, when, when it finds RDP, it'll even go as far as showing um, screenshots of the RDP uh, logon session. And if we can see that, that's what the threat actors are seeing. So, um, you know, we're trying we're trying to use a lot of the tools that the threat actors would be. Uh, of course, we're trying to use those tools to, uh, uh, you know, mitigate having another cyber event. But um, I can't say it enough. If someone was in the security session this morning, they heard me get on my RDP soapbox. Um, RDP, there's no, there's no need to, uh, there's no reason to use RDP. If you think that uh, you, you have to have RDP, we'd be more than happy to set up a call, set up a session, um, or, you know, a Zoom session or whatnot, uh, just to chat about your options. Um, you know, log me in, splash top, Bumgar, there's, there's plenty of options out there. Yes, they do cost money, but you know, and, and if you're looking for funding um, for this uh, and your management's going, you know, their budgets are real tight, I understand this. You just have to explain it to them. You know, do we spend $3,000, $4,000 a year? I'm just throwing those numbers out there. So, you know, some, some, you can get some things cheaper. Um, or do we, do, do we want to be in, uh, the next cyber event and I lose tens, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, off of, um, you, know, um, you know, lost time, you know, uh, you, you just name it. You, know, you, you think about the worst day in any IT um, uh, professional's life is the uh, day you have a cyber event. So um, RDP is, there are multiple products out there that can be uh, utilize remote access to um, servers, to workstations um, without setting up VPNs. I mean, you know, you, there's no need to expose RDP to the outside world. And quite frankly, there should be no reason that you, um, should require RDP even internally. I mean, even if you have it locked off from the outside world, but you have it open, you know, kind of free, um, freestyle in, in, inside your network, that once a threat actor gets in, they can easily laterally move across your network and it takes no effort on their part to do that. So um, I will get off my RDP soapbox <laughs> again and turn that over to another strike team member. Oh, <laughs> okay. Go ahead, I'll, I'll just add to, to Scott's soapbox. And I, I think, I know I've been in this situation before and I, I suspect that a lot of our friends that are, are listening right now um, have been too. But if, if you've got a vendor that you're working with and they're telling you in today's environment that you need to open up port 3389 and allow them the remote desktop into your server, then- Another vendor. Yeah, then you you really need to think about that. You know that that vendor does not have your best interests at heart. And if I mean if they're ignorant about it, that's bad. If they understand the the dangers and they still want you to do it, that's even worse. Um, so if, you know we would, and I think any of us would, you know, if if you're having a problem with a vendor about something like that, any of us would be more than happy to hop on a call with you. And you know, basically, cuss that vendor out. Shannon's really and, good and at so that, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> you know, get Shannon. So I, I'll I'll make this point, and I heard when Mark said it. I don't want anybody to be on the fence about um, when you provide those IP addresses. Really, all we're doing is providing attribution to your organization. Um, again, Shodan's already going to be doing these scans, and so what this does, and you know, you you can have your own you know, $50 a month 
uh, account with Shodan, but the account we decided to do because it was using Nickel Giza and it did uh, meet the needs of multiple organizations is we bumped up the level, which gives us that access to if it matches a known CVE, which was really, really important during the exchange proxy login, uh, logon issue. Shodan started, scan if they knew it was exchange, they were doing multiple day um, scans and actually putting the timeline in there so you could see remediation times. And again, this is the fingerprint of the bad guys that they're looking at. I mean, you'll see it if there's an HVAC exploit. So, and I've seen a couple of emails popping through with the, the email addresses. We don't want it to come across as, you know, this is proprietary or personal information. Um, it's really not. It's just attribution. And you don't know, you're helping yourself. You're helping the state. It's really how your exposure to the network is. It's your public facing IP addresses. And I wouldn't say to just leave it at, okay, we've got a block of, you know, 14 usable, but we're only using three. Well, I'll just send you the three that we're using. What ends up happening is, is if you have an old device that may have had a NAT rule that you cut off and then all of a sudden it gets powered back on or something comes up with that same IP address and now it's listening and it may be more insecure. So it's easy enough for us to put the full CIDR range in or the, the you know, if you want it in normal dash format, whatever. Um, you, we've got enough block. The only one that really um, put us over the edge and we just removed it was uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools because they just, they had, I think, a class B and it was like, okay, well, that's, that's an exception. You know, we'll, we'll deal with that a different way. Um, so again, just really want to point that out that the attribution is extremely helpful. And to that point, we're going to try and figure out what it is, even if you don't tell us. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but, you know, you're, you've got MX records, you're sending emails to a listserv, you're communicating. There's a lot of things that expose out your public IP address anyway. Um, and so we're going to try and figure out those attributions. So if we don't have everybody on the call, um, because it, it is extremely important to know which local government, K-12, I know Amy's been involved. If we see anything from a K-12 space, you know, she'll reach out, try and communicate. Um, I mean, it's just, we're, we're doing it all for the right reasons. And, you know, I, that's where working together really helps. So I'll get off and, my soapbox of IP attribution. And um, uh, just to, to kind of reiterate something there, um, this is, uh, as Rob said in, the, in his presentation during the uh, business meeting, um, you know, this is just another link in that chain. And we are working very closely with the state, with the with National Guard to provide this multi-pronged approach to uh, cybersecurity and, and, and just really laying on the, the layers of, of, um, uh, of security. Uh, it, it's, it's, there's nothing, um, nothing nefarious or nothing that, that you know, we, people are, are, are worried about, you know, I don't want the state to see this, that, and the other. It's not about that at all. It's, it's purely just to support one another. Um, and so I, I just, I, I, I hear, we hear, you know, echoes of, of people being um, untrustworthy of, of DIT in the state. And we just don't, we want to try to, uh, um, you know, restore faith somewhat from some of, the, some of us who have been uh, in North Carolina local government for years and years and years, um, that, uh, that, that they are doing, they are doing things the right way and they, they they're only there to support us and to help us so yeah and not only is it a, a multi-pronged approach like uh mark said but it's also also a multi-perspective approach and that's one great thing about the relationship that we have um in this jccf framework is there's been times where the guard has, has scanned something or found something that, that maybe threw up a red flag to them um, and, and they'll pass that information on to us. And because we know uh, local government environments very, very well, we can look at that information and say, oh yeah, yeah, that's really not anything to worry about. Or, oh yeah, that's something that, that we really need to worry about. So there, we've got a great established working rapport with them and it's, it's just a really good system and, and it's all mutually beneficial. Right, and I, and I would say since um, uh, the strike team has been involved in cyber incidents um, and, and been involved with the state. And of course, the, um, the, you know, the, um, the um, formalizing the JCTF, the, the, the relationship between the strike team, DIT, National Guard, FBI, this has gotten better over time. It improves every time we have after action. We've started having after action reports to how can we improve? And it's all about 
And, and if we're back to Randy's point, if we're scanning, uh, you know, IPs, it's so we 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 want to see you at the conferences, and we want to see you on a uh, on a, a more uh, happier note, not uh, uh, coming in to help you uh, recover uh, from uh, an event. So, um, and so you know, like to Mark's point, is is all all this is coming from. Uh, it's kind of like a whole, the DIT says it's a whole state approach. Um, and, um, you know, the IT strike team is just part of that, that team and to, we're to here to help everyone in, in the Nicholas Jesus community. Yeah, because the scenario that Randy outlaid as far as uh, an old device getting turned on and there being a NAT rule in there, that, that wasn't hypothetical. We've seen yeah. that happen. It's, it's happened, yeah. That's and it's right. easy to, it's easy to get in, you know, have a rule, a really old rule to an old IP address and forget about it being in your firewall, you know the device is offline or that device is gone and a new device comes along with that IP and then all of a sudden you got an open port with an open problem. Right. Just as an inside, uh, any of the, the hypothetical situations that, that we may mention are not ever hypothetical. <laughs> it's stuff that we've actually seen. Right, right. Um, so uh, uh, next thing that we wanna talk about is uh, Purple night is that next? Yes, it is. Yeah. Purple night. Um, so, is anyone by a I don't know show of hands or something check mark? Uh, anyone familiar with Purple Night? Well, yeah, we know you are. No, oh, okay, fine. All right, I got a few. Okay, well, good. All right, so Purple Night, uh, what it is 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 a, a really cool. Uh, tool that will uh, scan your Active Directory schema and uh, notify you of any um, issues that it finds. Um, it will give you a score. Um, and uh, Randy has been, uh, I'm going to let Randy uh, talk more about it because he's been working closely with the Pur Purple Knight folks and they've been fantastic to work with and, and really accommodating for what we're doing here. Randy? Sure. Yeah. So Purple Knight came out of you know, I can't even remember how we stumbled across it. Uh, it's just one of those tools that you end up finding. But in all of the responses, most everything has an Active Directory component. Um, and Purple Knight is basically this free tool, just like you used to have. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, there used to be a lot of really good tools that would come out of all the major players. I mean, think of when Nessus used to be free and things like that. So Purple Knight is kind of that tool. Uh, it runs, you can run it, you don't even have to run it on a DC. I think it's easy to run it on a DC. Um, it's all self-contained. We've got the link here uh, for it. But what was interesting about it is it goes through, determines like, and actually if you, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, that way I can know what I'm talking about um, or put it in context and we can go back to the other for the link. So it, it basically just gives you a quick report um, and it gives you the, the, the holistic number um, you know, and it took a little bit of effort to get to 81%. That was at mine as of last night uh, for Rowan County. And so it goes through, looks at the different, different options, um, talks about account security, you know, like passwords that have not expired um, or haven't, you know, that haven't had any use but are not expired, um, old passwords. So there's some tools that no before has for like weak password and things like that we might talk about. But this is kind of the structure of your AD security platform. Um, you know, delegation, how your group policies, some of those holes that you might have. Now, what's interesting about Purple Knight is Lynn uh, Smith is the one that has kind of been the person that we contacted for this. Um, and, and because we had to, you know, ask for access. Interestingly enough, he's from Connecticut. He worked in state government. And so it just clicked when we started talking about things that he was seeing in his environment and what we're seeing. And so he's been really supportive and said, OK, we're giving it away for free. We want people to be able to use it. So we're kind of offering it up. Uh, you can go back to the previous slides so people can grab the link. Um, so it's a quick download. You run it. You get a score. And so just kind of like you would do a password complexity or things like that, since Active Directory is so much of a piece, we all thought it would be a neat gamification, if you will, for, hey, we're starting in spring. For those that want to participate, run your scores now. You're, you're, you're going to fail. I mean, in most cases, I mean, it's going to be pretty low. I mean, like I said, it took a long time just to, uh, going through some processes to get to 81, um, and, that, and you still see the, the, the other scores. 
so with that, we want to go back into the fall session and say, okay, who's improved the most? You know, that means you've just put some time into looking at security. You're trying to improve. Um, and then, so what's the biggest gap between here's what your score was and here's where it is now. Uh, I thought that'd be really good. And on top of it, uh, Lynn with Purple Knight and uh, some Paris have, you know, told us that they'll put engineers, we can get on Zoom calls um, and actually walk through. Because I said, you know, a lot of our local governments are going to be running very similar Active Directory configurations. And there's going to be certain pieces that everybody's going to be seeing. And they said, oh, well, that's great. We'll get some solution engineers, not look at anything from a product perspective, but just literally changing group policies, going through, um, f- figuring out, like we saw some earlier ones with uh, Azure Connect doing like Microsoft Online accounts, those MSOLs. Uh, they changed some of that and adapted, but they'll offer to come in do a session kind of with our Nickel Giza group, and it can be more than one to just kind of tackle some of the common issues. Uh, so, again, the tool's there, easy to download. We've got the form link to kind of post your, your scores. Um, and then we'll just do it again in the fall. Um, and then whoever wins, it'll be in person. We'll figure out something really neat. Um, I mean, the board's really good about coming up with cool prizes and concepts. So I'm sure there's going to be something good for it. Uh, plus, it's just improving your cyber hygiene. It's a quick, easy tool. Um, anybody else want to say anything more? Yeah, I, I, I just want to jump in and say, um, as you do this, if you if you want to participate, we uh, Ted put the uh, the link to the the download and the form uh, in the chat. Um, but if you do want to uh, participate in this, uh, the form is uh, it, it's only visible to us on the back end, uh, so nobody can see what your score is, and it's and it's nothing to 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 be embarrassed about or anything. But the biggest thing that we want um, is if you do it now and then do it again in the fall to see how much you've improved um, is to keep track of the, uh, of the remediation steps and, and let us know, like, if, if you're the most improved, we want to know what you did and how you did it and, and, uh, and you know, give you credit where credit is due, um, give you the kudos that you deserve. So, uh, yeah, I, we, we encourage everyone to participate in this because it's, it's, it's really, uh, it, it takes less than a minute to run against your, your AD domain, uh, your AD. And uh, also, the last thing that I, I uh, oh, and Matthew asked, where do you run it? You do not have to run it from a uh, domain controller. It's just a, do, a, a domain join PC. Uh, the last thing is that- um, With no special privileges. No special privileges, right. Uh, the last thing to say about it is that if you, are in a uh, an organization that has multiple um, forests. Um, you can run them separately against uh, each forest, and then you can fill in the form. Uh, you know, fill in three forms for for each fund, or and, as many forms as you need. Rather. And keep in mind, I just want to make sure that nobody, you, you know, not asking for anything but the numbers. You know, it's best just to keep up with the score. Um, I, I whited out the username that I ran it under, which gives the NetBIOS name, and then also your domain name. So it's, there's nothing to it except just the number. Um, so I'll, I'll just and add, we'll, like I said, we'll get there. Yep. Sorry, Randy. Uh, one, one great thing about this tool, I think that we all like is that it really gives you some, some specific steps to remediate the, the problems that it finds. I, I will uh, kind of, like I said, as a disclaimer, um, just be careful and kind of understand the changes you make because, um, because they're I, just me personally. I know I, I, I broke uh, something trying to beat Randy's score. Uh, so <laughs> um, just just make sure you're, you're careful with that. But again, like I said, um, it it really does lay out the, the remediation steps really nicely. Right. You can't, you can't just, well, hold yeah. on a second. He can't just throw that out and then not tell us if he actually beat Randy's score. I did not beat No, Randy's no, no. Score. Hold on, hold on. I, I will say this. No, but don't do, listen to Ted. That we, we can get the sessions together. If there are things that you, you think for a second you may not need to do, hold off until we get them on the phone. We can have like a good Zoom session with everybody because I read the whole protected groups thing put everybody in protected groups, and then I couldn't log back in. Luckily, luckily, I didn't put everything, all of the domain admins in the protected group. So, so anyway, yeah. I, yeah, it, it, yeah. I, I, did, I did the same thing, and I said, like, oh, protected groups, I can make that happen. And then, you know, stuff stops working. 
um, but uh, you know, uh, to um, to with the score, you know, um, get like like uh, Randy said to, to get to his score, he had a, uh, a quite a bit of work. Um, you know, hundred percent. I don't think any of us are going to get to hundred percent because of it's going to break a lot of our applications. Uh, just like if we went to full CIS level three, right? We could we can't run our networks uh, like that. Um, so. The, the the goal is to get as high as possible uh, within your environment, and you know then you know what your risk is, and you can mitigate that risk through other tools. But um, but you know so 100% may be achievable with uh, with Purple Knight, um, but it's it's going to take a lot of work to get there, um, and sometimes you may not be able to get there because it may break your ERP application, it may break your uh, police department or your sheriff's department's um, applications, just because you know in some of these legacy applications. But um, and if you know when in doubt, like if Randy said, we're trying to we're going to hopefully get people to run it, get a larger session set up with the the engineers. But you know if you uh, want to reach out to the strike team. And, you know, um, ask us uh, what we think and what we've seen and maybe we can help guide you. If not, we can get you in touch with the people, uh, the engineers. So we're ready to move on. I think so. All right. Well, actually, hold on. Let's make sure we don't have any questions. If anybody yeah. has oh, yeah. or any. Yeah, let's... Anyone got any questions of every anything we've covered up to now? Any questions at all? Feel free to unmute yourself and, and shout them out yeah. if you will. And direct all questions to Mark. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, do you do you want them answered correctly or not? Uh, who is okay, the Chad? Answer? Chad, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, Kevin asked, do we recommend CIS versus NIST controls? I'll take that one for $500. <laughs> um, Kevin, if you can implement NIST 853, you're worth a million bucks. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, I mean, we can't even figure out how to implement IG two and three uh, with CIS controls. See, I will say this, the latest CIS controls is a really good, practical non-federal community based you can you know it just it makes sense um i mean it, it, there's a crosswalk don't get me wrong the state uses nist 853 um but there's just a reality of what's a good check sheet um so personally i, I like the cis controls i literally can map every item or every control and sub control either to something we do or something that we pay for uh, or both of course you know if it's something we do and that we pay for um so I, it makes really good sense I, so that's my thoughts yep. yeah I, I think the main thing is just to do a framework you know pick a framework whether it's uh, stig cis nist you know look over them see which one may be a good fit for your environment uh you know and pursue it and it's going to be a journey um, you're not just going to be able to flip those things on and uh, walk away and be like, oh, I've applied this framework. If you do, you're going to break a lot more stuff, just like we were talking earlier. Um, it, it takes a lot of time, at, you know, and there's different approaches. We approached it just doing a few controls at the time. So we knew exactly what we applied and if something was broke and we could go back and we knew exactly what to do to undo it. Um, and there's going to be a lot of those controls in there. You'll just have to individually evaluate for your environment to say, can I turn this on? I, may, I might not be able to turn this particular control in this particular set on. I originally went down the STIG path because um, I kind of liked the way, the way those were, and I had some access to those STIGs from an events we went on. Um, but that got to be a little bit more difficult to get my hands on because it's a, a military type product. Um, and is born out of that environment. Um, CIS, as, as Randy was saying, is community-based. Um, if you just sign into the benchmarks, you can download them. Um, and, and now the actual stigs are in there, they're a little easier to get your, get your hands on those as well. Um, but CIS was a, a good fit for us from that perspective. Not only are they effective controls, but the ability to have some input into the process and availability of the downloads uh, is, is a factor in that decision. And, uh, and, and to add on to that, uh, MS ISAC, multi-state ISAC, uh, is, they're, they're a great resource and, and they're really responsive typically when you have any issues or questions about it. So, um, uh, and, and the, the uh, uh, 
MSI that community as well. People ask questions on there all the time and we get good in, give good answers, get good answers. All right, we're gonna move on. Maybe. Yep. There we go. Cyber triage. Scott, you want to take that one? Or Chad? Or Ted. Uh Chad, Ted, if not, I'll take it. Um, so uh, cyber triage is a, um, is a uh, forensics tool uh, that um, the Guard uses heavily through uh, this one of their tools in their toolkit uh, they use for um, when they're doing threat hunting. But cyber triage also gives a very, very good snap, um, a quick, dirty um, look at a machine that um, uh, has potential compromise. Um, the idea for this is to... Um, uh, run the capture um, uh, should be done before machine is rebooted uh, so we can get the memory state uh, of what's happening. Um, and it, 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 once it runs through, looks at the machine, we can also run it again from YAR rules and some other uh, public source rules uh, or open source rules. And we also, uh, the strike team has a, um, a, a cyber triage installation that um, we can run and it will query their, their databases, but also uh, other databases to kind of see what the, if there's any CVEs, is there any th uh, threats, anomalies on that machine? Um, and it's not like a full image capture. It runs through, it captures a forensic data set. And then um, the strike team is actually building uh, a system where in the event you have an issue, we could, uh, you know, real quickly um, put eyes on it to say, yes, this is what it is. And then, you know, for the the hardcore forensic threat hunting, that's the National Guard. That is their bread and butter. Uh, we there, we're there to um, assist them, but we started using this tool to kind of um, expand our own knowledge on uh, certain threats um, and how to mitigate them. And, uh, but uh, it's also helps us out if there's some, some anomalies there that, um, you know, uh, and we can help vet it and help, you know, help the whole uh, JCTF. Um, but, um, I didn't read it from, uh, word for word for the slide, but um, any, Randy, Mark, anybody want to add? Yeah, I mean, this is just a, sorry, Randy, let me, I just want to say that this is just, a, it's, it's kind of similar to FTK Imager, um, and, which is another tool. Um, and uh, this one, uh, it, it does a, a pretty quick scan of, a, of an image uh, once it's captured, and it gives a pretty comprehensive report on, on, on its findings as well. So. It's been a uh, it's been a good tool and it's, it's a fantastic learning experience for us. Yeah, and I'll answer Logan's question with this with FTK Imager. So Cyber Triage was designed. It actually is based on some of the open source. I mean, it's the same group uh, that just has a commercial product that collects different sets, of registry information, event log, um, and in fact, we actually I think they got a lot of requests during the Exchange Proxy login. Uh, log on to get um, web shells or get ASPX files that were under the INET pub WWW root. So they added that. It, it, now, it took them a while, um, but, you know, they just probably had their release schedules. So FTK Imager, that's another one. But, you know, that re that requires a larger image capture. The Guard definitely does FTK Imager. Uh, this gives, and it's called the triage tool because it's it's kind of that interim. You, you want maybe want to capture it on more. You might want to get all of your domain controllers. Uh, your exchange server, where if you're doing that with FTK, you're going to be eating up a lot of space and a lot of time, depending on your infrastructure. So this kind of, you know, if you think about it, if it's you, you think you might have uh, patient zero, but there's going to be three patient zeros that you might not know. If you capture cyber triage, especially if you're looking at an event, you walk out, it, it's kind of like the purple night. It's a self-contained tool. Uh, we're working on doing the S3 upload so that it actually goes straight um, to a location that we can easily share with the guard. So, you know, there's, that's been a big thing with the remote um, and, and with the pandemic is how do you not have boots on the ground and actually have limited people that can start sharing information. You've got limited bandwidth. Um, you know, when you're moving around full FTK images or in case images, you, you somebody's dragging a hard drive around uh, in most cases. And, and depending on where you're at in the state, that might be pretty far away from Raleigh. Uh, this has let us move a lot of information around, capture it from uh, different places. And cyber triage, what we've got through the strike team is actually the paid version of that. It's the team's version. Uh, so that lets us kind of put things in very similar to FTK with the cases, in case with case management. Uh, you know, if we're doing something with, you know, town of Mooresville, you know, and I just threw that out because I saw uh, Matt in there. It, it's just, you know, hey, we'll, we'll build a case and you've got three servers, um, you know, that you might want. 
all of those can be put in and it can actually cross reference with timelines and things like that. So it's been a learning experience for us. Um, <laughs> yes, Matt, you are very famous. You're famous. Um, so, you know, it, it's a really cool tool. Uh, we'd be happy to show you what it does. Like if you wanted to run it now, I will say that's probably another neat thing we had talked about when we were preparing everything is some of these tools are better just to kind of say, Hey, well, let me go ahead and run it and see what would I have to go through. Um, you know, you'd be, you'd be pretty amazed at some of the things. So, you know, we'd be happy to kind of set up and, and run through. We do a lot of, you know, ad hoc Zoom meetings um, where we're just getting together and, you know, looking at some stuff. So it, it, it's fun, it, lots of learning from it. Um, and so we'd be happy to do that. Anybody wants to have anything else to cyber triage? You want to tell them about the Yara rules, Randy? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not really great on yard rules i wish we had somebody from the guard you know to talk about yard rules but basically it's kind of you know it's just a set like reg x expressions uh that you're looking for that you know when a something comes out um if there's certain files or types that you know there's there's a new hash and, and you really, really yard rules it might even be an md5 or sha1 hash it might be a reg x in a folder it might be a particular registry key uh, but you put them in and it'll flag them and it'll, so it'll say this is completely a red incident and so when you get that in cyber triage, it also puts it in a timeline. So you can go through and see, okay, so say you did leave RDP on, you know, um, and you've been brute force, but, oh, well, three months prior to that, you actually had this other event and you have these other remnants of somebody doing spam, which was probably another threat actor. You can start dividing up, um, you know, potentially multiple events or something was left there. And this is where I'll get on my soapbox. Um, sorry, not trying to offend anybody, but there's been a conversation about rootkit removal. Rootkit removal is called re-imaging and getting rid of that uh, image. Um, again, not to offend anybody, but these attackers are very good. The APT side of it, of staying dormant. Um, if you think that there's a reason that it's compromised and it's to flag something, get the data off, re-image it, and start over again. Just wanted to say that um, I heard that this morning, but and cyber triage is one of those tools that can help. It does not clean anything. It's just forensic and uh, incident response. Sorry, that was my little soapbox. Yeah, and we and we, we, we get on these uh, the soapboxes sometimes because it, these are these are issues that are easily mitigated uh, or easily uh, prevented, um, but either vendors are pushing one way or, or uh, you know, or, or it's just because, you know, we're all human and we all get set in our ways on how we do things. And, and um, you know, there's, uh, uh, it, it seems to be the same set of circumstances in almost every response. There's always, you know, the AD components there, RDP is 90% of the time is in play. Uh, with uh, an event with, with the lateral spread or you know coming in from the outside, so uh, that's why we we get on our soapboxes a little bit because it, these these things can be prevented uh, for the most part. So uh, now, if we want to completely uh, prevent any ransomware or any cyber event, we just get rid of all of our users and we'll be good. Yeah, so, exactly. But, um, uh, but uh, uh, I was going to say something and it just it just blew my mind. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> All right, next, next up. Oh I, no, okay. I, I know what I was going to say, but uh, the, to uh, to Scott's point, you know, one of the things that that uh, we find is that there's a, a rightly or wrongly there's there's a reluctance when we say kill it with fire, <laughs> you know, uh, go scorched earth and and um, uh, and, and reimage as Randy said. Uh, removing uh, the rootkit or removing any any sort of um, malware from a system is never going to be a 100% guarantee that you've got everything. So there's always a reluctance on the part of the people that we, we try to help. Um, you know, do I really have to re-image this, this domain controller? Do I really have to re-image this file server? It, it, it's, it's all a, a, a question of how much risk you want to take on and how much risk you want to mitigate. Um, so uh, the, if you want to be 100% sure that you got everything, you, you just re-image everything. Scorched earth. Go ahead, yeah. Scott, sorry. 
Oh, and I wanted to say, and I said the uh, I said the word vendor. Um, you know, most of the you know when we say vendors, uh, we're not. It's not all vendors out there that have are not using best security practices. There are a lot of more, and the and the mm -hmm. vendors that support the Jesus community um, are are the ones that you doing the best security practices. Um, it's it's you know the ones that have been entrenched are the ones that it's the mom. Uh, you know, it's the the vendor that was you know you know. They shouldn't be supporting business type networks. They should be supporting home computers. Um, but um, it's not. We we run into um, quite a few vendors out there that um, are supporting um, municipalities that are actually great. They're doing the work and um, and you know they're willing to you know improve and, and do the best security practices and stuff. I just wanted to clear, clarify that. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about. Uh, the ass sensor again, Mark. Okay. Um, so uh, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this because uh, Rob already went through um, through this with, with uh, during the business meeting. Um, it's it's a fantastic opportunity. It's a basically a um, twenty to thirty thousand dollar appliance that you get for nothing. Um, that, and well, we don't get it for nothing. I mean, it's, it's NCDIT is, is buying them um, and they're putting them in all counties or trying to get to all counties. Um, the goal is 100%, but uh, they're starting with, with tier one, uh, tier two counties. Um, and, um, it, you know, if you, if you want to get bumped up on the list, you have a cyber event, apparently. Um, <laughs> no, don't do that. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, Again, another fantastic resource and um, offering from from uh, DIT that uh, you should very much take advantage of. Uh, it's hard. It, it's it is very rare that you get a uh, a, a security appliance at no cost. Um, right, a security appliance plus a managed sock that plus uh, a managed sock not, yeah. that, that will have twenty uh, twenty four seven eyes on on your uh, alerts. So, and Ted can. Yeah. Uh, Ted, Ted seems to be a happy uh, eye, eye sensor user, so he could speak uh, more. And, uh, and, and yes, uh, to Rob, uh, Rob's point and Kevin's question, yes, is only counties right now. The, the, uh, the main driver of this was election security. I'm working on them, guys. I'm working on them. Yes, uh, Scott. <laughs> and is, I, Chris is, I, I saw Chris's, uh, Chris Butt's comment about tier three. If you're, if you're interested uh, as a tier three county, and you don't already have an IDS IPS, um, you know, definitely I, you can contact us or Rob Main. And because I, I know they're they're trying to make sure that they, you know, put everything out that they had funding for uh, because they're asking for the same funding to fund all of them next year. Uh, so it was really more just making sure. So, yeah, I, I would say if you're a tier three county uh, and you don't already have control that control in place, that's I'm sure that's going to be one of the questions is, do you already have something that's doing IDS, IPS at your north-south edge? Um, and I did want to clarify, it is a 24-7, 365 sock, but it is not, you know, a sock that's watching all your east-west traffic, things like that. Nothing that that's bad. I'm just, you know, just putting it in perspective that the placement really does matter. Um, if, if, if you've got multiple sites and multiple internet connections, you know, they're not going to put five devices out there for you. Uh, it's going to watch your main internet. So if you're not aggregating them all, you know, if you're, if your election, I'm just thinking County, if your elections is on a different circuit in a different location and you get, get one put in at your primary government center, um, you know, it's not watching that particular North South. So, you know, there, you, you got to put it in context, but all that would be discussed. Um, so our, our main goal is just to make sure you understand that it does exist. It, it has, does have value. Um, I think we, when our conversations with, uh, Jamie, SecureWorks, and uh, DIT, you know, they kind of invite us in to look at it from a different, like a, a true local government perspective. And these are the kind of things we found um, that it does. Helps you satisfy the control, does give you a true IPS and the 24-7 SOC monitoring that actually alerts not just, it, that's almost like an automatic notification. Uh, the JCTF does have resources that are involved with that if it's, if it's a detected known, you know, attack. So... And, um, Travis, it, it, uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if Randy or Scott or Ted or Chad know the answer to your question of, of exporting to a, uh, an existing SIM for uh, uh, correlation. 
Uh, but that is a question that I'm sure uh, Rob Main and or Jamie Spradlin can can answer. And uh, if you need their their contact, we can we can certainly well, that to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of one of the issues and and possibly why they haven't had more buy-in from our our some counties is kind of people trying to figure out how it fits in. So oh, my firewall is already doing this. My firewall's already got IPS. So why why would I need the eye sensor? So I mean, to answer, um, who was it, Tra Travis, Travis's question? Yep. Um, you know, really, you know, if you're already sending that that information from your firewall to your seam, it, it might kind of be redundant. But like Randy said, I think I think the the SOC aspect of this is why it kind of kind of at least for us it makes it a no brainer. Um, so that that part of it, I mean, I don't know a lot. Maybe y'all have people in your IT departments that, you know, everybody can sit down in front of Wireshark and just, you know, say exactly what that means. But, you know, most of us are just regular old sysadmin guys. So to have those those um, trained professionals in the SOC watching your traffic and that kind of thing is, is a really, and especially for free, it's a, um, it's a really great service. Um, and I think it, it's something that anybody could use. And let me let me answer Tony's question um, because I you know this is this is the reason why we started looking at it as well because I originally wanted east west tra I was under the impression that I could look at east west traffic um, it, you you don't want east west traffic with this I mean not with the product that they have there there's other tools there's I mean there's a different way but what what the contract states and how they're what we found out from Jamie um, and I'm I'm gonna mute here for just a second there's an ambulance sorry I want to finish that. <laughs> okay, uh, so don't don't use it with the um, 10 gig. I, we did find out in review that it, it can. They are there are one gig interfaces on it. Um, so you know, depending on where your firewall is, um, if your firewall itself has 10 gig ports, um, great. If you've got 10 gigs of the internet, great. It, it, it's it's going to be out of what they bought. Um, but if you have you know copper gig interfaces, that's possible. They can do some fiber. Um, but it's all it's all about what your sustained bandwidth is, and that's what we were understanding uh, is that, you know, while it may be a, a, the smaller device may be sized for 250 meg, which is what Rob had in that slide, it's that you can actually have big connections. It's just what your sustained bandwidth is. But I, I will tell you, we have our site to site VPNs and where we hooked it up. There is some east west traffic. The rules are not good. I mean, in my mind, I think you'd just be messing with it all the time. So, Tony, I just at least want to answer that for the East West. I wouldn't, it's, I, that's where you put North South. And we, you know, we can really get into the weeds of all that right now. We probably don't have time, but I would say if you're, if you don't have an eye sensor, if you're a county at least and you don't have one and you, you kind of want to, you're not just not sure about it and you don't trust the DIT guys, just reach out to us and we, we we'll be happy to talk you through it. And, you know, specifically talk about placement like Randy just was, because I think, that's definitely um, kind of caused some confusion um, out there. So, and we we've seen people put it like outside their firewall, which is definitely we don't think is a very good idea. Yeah, and to answer uh, Heath's question, um, right now it is only for uh, counties, um, uh, municipalities, K twelve community colleges. They're uh, they're not included in this initial um, rollout, um, but um, you know we'll see. <laughs> As speaking for, as a, as the uh, municipality uh, rep on the IT strike team, I'm pushing them. Yeah, he is. Well, and I think I think the reason for that way back then was the elections, right? Wasn't right. It? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. Any, We're uh, short any, on any time. more questions on the uh, on the eye sensor? Yep. Yeah. We, we can uh, eye sensor oh. or anything else. Oh, okay. Enough? We're at the we're at the end. So yeah, we can. Yeah. Any questions that y'all have, feel again, feel free to unmute and uh, or you just throw them in the chat. So are you guys um, recruiting for both uh, the strike team for cybersecurity yeah. and for um, emergency? Yeah, hurricanes, tornadoes, forest fires. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, recruitment. What we have found is that we are in need of very specific skill sets uh, as we go through. Um, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so that, that email address there, 
you know, what we're finding is that during an event, it's very helpful. Like if you, if you know, hyper V and, you know, there might be a rebuild, um, you know, certain types of clustering, you know, dealing with different NAS or SAN devices, um, certain firewalls. So those skill sets, you know, are really good. And that's kind of what we're seeing the way the team's kind of structured, you know, we've gotten really good at the responses and getting all the right folks involved. Uh, you know, imaging, you know, we're, if there's folks that have really good imaging methods, Chad's come up with a really good way uh, to image. And if we can work with somebody, you know, that might know other tools, because uh, you never know what the environment's going to be. So, yeah, yes, thank you. Yep. And then, um, you know, just uh, email the IT strike team at nikajiza.org. Um, and then, you know, the, for the skill sets for the uh, cyber uh, side, you know, like the Randy said, we're looking uh, at uh, specific skill sets. Um, and uh, and for, for when it comes from the EM side for uh, responding to uh, hurricanes and whatnot, um, you know, that, that's more general IT our skills. Um, and because usually you're putting um, at a, a uh, EM facility where you're going to have to support, you know, make sure the network, you know, you don't have to know networking per se, but you make sure that you know, they still have internet, their printers work and, you know, end user support. So it's um, the it's strike team as a whole has a very a wide variety of expertise and um, people there. And, um, you know, we, uh, we usually do ask if you do, um, you're on the strike team and you do get deployed to a cyber incident or, a um, you know EM event, uh, we will uh, we will ask if at least um, uh, you know you could do at least forty eight hours. Um, you know that's not forty eight hours. You're working continuously. There's usually shifts, but um, that way we can plan rotations out. Um, and you know, the, the, the the one the strike team uh, members that are on the call now that are labeled on here that that's your uh, strike team uh, um, you know, the leadership of the strike team and we're uh, we're the cy cyber uh, range the core cyber group and the core uh, of the normal uh, strike team but um, we do bring in a lot of other um, um, uh, expertises along the way and you know we responding to events we have um, you know got more of those people to uh, want to volunteer and pay it forward after he helping them. So, um, uh, but yes, we were looking for any and all expertise. So if you're interested and want to have a little bit further conversation, just email us at the email address. In fact, it, all the strike team leaders, if you email that uh, email address, we all get the messages and one of us will respond to you. Um, and if you, uh, if you need us uh, directly, um, you know, that, that number, uh, the 919-726-6508, uh, uh, that actually rings uh, uh, my phone, uh, Mark's phone, and Randy's phone 24-7. Um, uh, so, um, but um, does anybody else have any questions? Scott, if it's okay, I'm going to jump back in and again, thank our platinum sponsor rubric. And I also we want to end with ThinkGuard as our gold sponsor for this session. And at ThinkGuard, unlock ordinary service providers, data protection such as backup and disaster recovery and cybersecurity is all we do. We don't take over IT departments. We're in the business of protecting them. Thank you to thank, uh, ThinkGuard. Thank you to Platinum or uh, Rubric. And guys, please make sure you go visit all of our uh, VPs that are out there in the exhibit hall and make sure you uh, thank them for being here with us and supporting us. Sorry, and Scott. Don't, and don't forget to tip your waitresses. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Amy. All right. See y'all later. Patrick, did you have a question? We got nowhere to be. Yeah, just yeah no. we're just hanging out. That's one of my guys. He may be. He may be. Uh... <laughs> Actually, I think they're getting ready to kick us. I think the room's getting ready to close. <laughs> All right. Well. I'm jumping off. Bye, guys. All right. See you all. Hey, Ted, you still there?